you can't mix law and grace. If you mix law and grace, you, 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 you don't get grace. Works and grace do not, cannot live in the same building. You wind up with confusion. Okay? You wind up with you, it just it becomes it becomes a nightmare and it is it is you as you read as you read the book of Acts and you see the church transitioning from a Jewish institution centered around Jerusalem to a Gentile institution spread throughout the world, you understand and you look all you have to do is look at the conflicts that were caused by people trying to mix law and grace. Say more. The reason for that, yes, what what God was saying was that in Romans, Paul was trying to explain to them that it is God that lives by by the grace, giving the power of the Holy Spirit, that they may live out the law, but through the human flesh, it's not possible. And so that is it. spot on, brother. That, that, see, we'll read we will read in the book of Romans where the weakness of the flesh is exploited by the law. And that since we cannot live through the law in the flesh, we've got to have something better. See, grace is, is the better part of law. We're going to get into that a little bit. So who's got <coughs> Galatians 3, 1 through 3? I do. Very good, Casey. Okay. Would you read those for us, please? Oh, foolish. Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Uh, before whose eyes Jesus Christ, having been evidently set forth, crucified among you, uh, this only what, what I learned of you, uh, uh, receiving ye the Spirit by works uh, of the law or by hearing of faith. Uh, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? See, the law pertains to the flesh. Now, God's made this very, it's making it very obvious for us in the book of Galatians that, that, yes, now that I'm saved, now I have the ability to keep the law. No, you didn't have the ability to keep the law when you started. You don't have the ability to keep the law when you're finished. The only time you have the ability to keep the law is when you are, when you are transformed in glory into something other than what we are today. And then you'll be able to keep it, which won't be do. Because you'll be what? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> So you know, you'll keep the law, but you'll do it. It'll, it'll, what will we say? Well, that'll be easy as pie. Joe, did I see you raise your hand? No. Okay, I just wonder. Because I'm, I'm trying to keep an eye on what's happening. No, remember this? What's happening? Mm -hmm. Try to try, try be on that. So we see in the book of Galatians how that is. God makes the answer obvious. The, the, now, you got to remember something. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the first century. This is probably somewhere in the 50s. Okay, not the 1950s, the 50s. Okay, 1900 over, almost, you know, we're talking, we're talking 1950 years ago. And Paul is fighting the battle against legalism, against Old Testament law trying to be applied to New Testament believers. And the battle has never stopped. And it will never come to an end because, because there is always in man survey time. Why would that battle never be over? Come to it. Why will why will why will men want to try to jam the law over grace? Control the people. Control the people. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and Baldoon, who remembers that? Give me one. Of, where's where's those where's those where's those sheets that I had to hand out right here? Yeah. Okay. And just give me one that I don't even think that it's going to be one. Just one. Just one. Just one. Okay. Quick break. Now that we're talking about control, just a fast break here. You know I'm going to be back for this in Sunday school, right? You know this is not going to come out of here. Think about getting close to done with this. I'll be back. Why don't you look at this? The line starts at the bottom and moves towards the top. I saw this at a friend's church last week. I took one look at that and I immediately took a picture of it because I said, this is gold! This is the work. I'm not, this is not my work. This is, 
I'm not this original nor am I this smart. And by the way, you don't have to be a genius to recognize a genius when you see one. That's right. Someone named Eric Homberger Erickson, a Viennese Jew who escaped from uh, Austria just prior to Hitler's purge of the Jews and oppression of the Jews came to America with his family as a young man. Uh, he was one of the first child psychologists. Yeah. It is of interesting note that he converted to Christianity at some point in his life. Really? And he came up with the eight stages of man from birth to <laughs> basically senility and old age. Okay? That's how the line progresses. From the lower left to the upper right. That's how the line progresses. These are the eight stages of man. I looked at this and I said, this is not the eight stages of man. This is many things. When you look at these things on this list, here's your homework. Think about your Bible. Think about life. And tell me what different things you could put on either side of this line. But I'm going to say, I'll just give you a clue. On the upper side of the line, speaking biblically, on the upper side of the line, you would have liberty. Mm -hmm. On the lower side of the line, you would have bondage. On the upper side of the line, you would have grace. On the lower side of the line, you would have law. Keep this. This is a wonderful little diagnostic tool. It will help you with your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. It will help you understand things about yourself and your own upbringing. It's wonderful. It's just, it's, it's a tool. But it's such a nice tool. It's like a crescent wrench, okay? It fits so many different things. Yes, sir. I'll add one more. Yes, sir. I would add uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ at the top and the devil at the bottom. That's what he's after. <laughs> I like it when people use that tools, amen? Okay. <laughs> so I really, I want you to think about this. You know, like, you must spend, you must spend some time. All of us need to spend time. Every day in our lives, we need to spend some time contemplating. I'll say this. Put this in the back of your head. The unexamined life is not worth living. Going along merrily without ever thinking about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and where, we're, where, it's, where, where what we are doing is taking us is to float downstream. A fellow once said, any dead fish can float downstream. Mm -hmm. It takes a live one to swim against the current. This is, as we, when, listen, this is why the Bible tells us, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Now, that may apply to salvation, but doesn't that also apply to every action that we take? Yes, it does. Does it not say in the scriptures that whatsoever is not a faith is? Sin. Sin. This is why we need to, this is why we need to examine our lives. Don't float downstream like the current. Swim upstream. By the way, folks, we'll be talking about that a little bit more in the second hour because we are now living in the days where everything we believe will be upstream against the current of the society and the world around us. This is what we're facing. And we're going to have to be strong. I don't want to get washed away. I don't want to end up downstream and going over faults. I don't care if I have to fight for this stuff, but there's nothing left. We'll fight. We'll fight. And where will we fight? On every front. We will fight it on the intellectual front. We will fight it on the political front. We will fight it on the emotional front. We will fight it on the spiritual front. Because that's how we fight. We don't leave your flank exposed. <laughs> We fight wherever and wherever the battle takes us, that's where we fight. So I want you to keep these. And as you spend some time, I want you to look and think of places. All different places. <coughs> I might already, already picked it up and 
started picking them up and laying them down and figured that out. The work of the work of uh, of Eric Erickson was very, very interesting. Let me just put it like this. Like I said, very interesting. And anytime, listen, I I have a lot of tools too. So I know where the door is. I have a lot of tools too. Tools are kept in best condition when you use them. <laughs> okay. All right. So here we are dealing with dealing with this fight that Paul has been engaged in 1950 years ago, and the fight never comes to an end. Little Mike says, "Why? Because the law makes it easy to control people. Yes, it does. You can use guilt. You'll notice that it's on the chart. You can use guilt to manipulate people by making them making them think that if they don't do what you command them to do, that they are wrong." That, my friends, is bondage. That is slavery. And that is what, and sadly, this is what religion does. Right? The, prob the problem is, is when people try to bring that religion into what we have, which is liberty of Christ. And that's when, that's when the battle gets hot. Now, I expect, I expect religions to do that. I expect religions to put people into bondage. But I expect faith in Christ people with the liberty. Ooh, wait, we can put those on both sides. On the other side of that line, right? Already did. Already did. There we are. Okay. So, that fight's not going to go away, and that's why we need to understand the specific... Ah, ah, listen, I'm going to can As a little boy, I would play with toys, but I would also try to take them apart and figure out how they work. If your children do that, you're in for you're in for an interesting time. You're in for an interesting time because they're going to they're going to take things apart on you that you may not necessarily want them to take apart, but they will do it. But that's okay because that's how the games develop. That's how, look. I was curious about how things work. I'm still curious about how things work, but I am equally curious about how things work in your Bible. There is a mechanics to the Bible. It's called philosophy. There's a philosophy of the Bible. How things work. And I've always been I've always been interested in it. And, and when I when I when I approach the Bible, I approach it like every other thing that I've ever had in my life. It's a it's a it's something that needs to be taken apart and examined. <laughs> okay, so it's my way. All right, let's go to Romans chapter seven. Who's got that, brother Joe? Yeah. When I see another law in my memory, weary against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law. Things. You're going to actually, God is going to show you things. 
He's going to show you things. He's going to bring you knowledge. Some of that knowledge is going to be shocking. Some of it's going to be disturbing. Some of it is going to be painful. But it will give you a depth and an insight that you did not have prior to gaining that knowledge. However, there is the stewardship of knowledge, too. To learn something is one thing. To learn something and learn how to keep it to oneself until the appropriate time, place, or person is important. That's wisdom. So pray for wisdom when you get knowledge, because knowledge, wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge. I learned some things, I learned some things that over this last month that were very disturbing to me. I am not at liberty to share those things with everyone, because some people would simply be overwhelmed. Some people would have their faith overthrown. Some people would not be able to handle. As as a guy in the movie once said, you can't and handle the truth. <laughs> and reality, the reality is that there. But if you ever wonder why sometimes, why sometimes a pastor or a preacher or an evangelist or a teacher is not willing to answer a question, the reason is that we are charged with a certain stewardship of the information that we are given. Sometimes that information is given to us, us alone, so that we can help someone. Uh, I had a pastor who would very frequently share personal and intimate things about people in the church. That he was sharing them with almost everybody else was irrelevant, except for the fact that they didn't know what. I said, okay, you can't get that ministry. That's no. Rule one, you can't keep a confidence. Get out of the ministry. Go work in a factory, dig ditches, do something that, you can, that you're qualified for. You can't keep a confidence, you can't qualify for the job. Okay? Secrets come here to die. Okay? And even tell me things about people, which of course, I, would have, I, learned, I learned early on that if you're going to be in the ministry of any sort, you're going to learn things about people that you don't want to know that will make you, if you allow them to, to think less of them, to esteem them lightly, you, the term for that is despise. And what you have to do is, even when you have that knowledge, is to not, is to, is to compartmentalize that information so you can deal with a person that you know things about as if you didn't know it. Mm -hmm. That you can treat them fairly. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can do this. That's why we have too many people in the ministry that aren't qualified for the ministry. They're not. That's why when you find a pastor that can keep confidence, don't lose it. Right? Keep them wrong. Because those are things, that's one of the things that matters. Okay? Part of the, it's part of the business, and if you can't handle that part of the business, then, you, then, then what did Jake Nicholson say? If you can't, you can't handle the truth. And that, see, that, that's a different way of using the word handle. Isn't it? Because, it is, yeah, you get, you get the truth. And I get the handle. You have to handle it carefully. Carefully. Okay. Where were we? That's right. Finish with Romans 5, 12, and 13. See, the law of sin, the moral law is the law of sin and death. It's going to come along and guarantee, it, the law guarantees death. Later on, we're going to look at the law of conscience, where the law of conscience also guarantees guilt. Okay? The law of sin and death also guarantees guilt. At one point in the scriptures, it says that all the world may become what? Guilty before God. So it's important. Yeah. Do we want the world guilty before God? Yes, we do. <laughs> Absolutely. Every step of the way, every minute of the day. Mm -hmm. Why? Because until you realize that you need to be saved, you won't be saved. saved. That's right. You won't get saved because you had no motivation. Right. The motivation for me getting saved was, I'm scared of hell. Okay? That was my motivation. There it is. Boy, isn't that kind of selfish? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Listen. Motivated self-interest, nothing more. I didn't get saved because Jesus was wonderful. He is. I didn't get saved because Jesus loved me unconditionally. He does. I did not get saved because he is, he is the master and creator of the universe. 
I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. It was entirely selfish, self motivated self interest. Later on, having been saved, God showed me these things and gave me more reason to love Him. Okay? What reason you get saved for is absolutely irrelevant. That you get saved is relevant. That and, and that you share this knowledge. This is it. Now, this is knowledge you want to share. Now, people say, if someone says, I can't handle the truth, say, you're going to be in real trouble because this is the truth. You have to handle it. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole world is guilty before God. So the moral law serves a purpose, which we will talk about a little bit later in some other verses. For now, let's go to what the law is. The law exists in three parts. I'm looking for answers. Hold on, Oh, well, okay, they're all written. All of them written. Okay. All of them written, but there are three parts to the written law because there are not just ten commandments, there are. Anybody know? Six, three, 632, 633. Leviticus laws. That's a lot. Hey, listen, this is, this, is, this is the law as given to Israel, okay? But it is divided into three parts. We talk about the moral law, we talk about the ten commandments. Plus what? Plus physical. There's criminal law. There's criminal law in the Old Testament. Yep. There's relational law. Mm-hmm. Dealings between people right. that are part of the moral law. This is why when Jesus sums up the law. Anybody remember when he did that? Well, he did that with, with the. Um when the guy uh, asked him, he said that he kept the law. He said, yeah, okay, fine. He said, but, he said, now, what is the most important law? And he asked Jesus that. Jesus said, well, the most important law is to love the Lord thy God with all thy faith, heart, and mind. Okay, now, what's he quoting? Do you know what part of scripture he's quoting when he says that? Okay, that was in, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Isaiah 6, 4 through 6. I shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind, all thy strength. And then he said, and the second is like unto the first. And what did he say? Love thy neighbor as thyself. As thyself. Right. Telling us two very, very important things. That's the question. The law hinges on not harming other people. And it also hinges on not harming yourself. Thou <laughs> shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thyself. Don't harm your neighbor, don't harm yourself. I would go so far as to say this. You see harm being done. Do what you can to stop it. Mm-hmm. Don't let someone harm you. Don't let someone harm other people. That's carrying the law. Am I, am I stretching the law right now? Really. No, we're talking about operating within good conscience, mm-hmm. which is another law that we're going to find in the book of Romans. Okay? This is why this is such an interesting study. Because there's so much in it, there's so much depth to it. It, cares, it, it ties into so many other places in the scripture. This is why we this is why we this. Good morning, How are you doing, bud? Good to see you. This is why we tie into the scriptures. It ties into so many scriptures. We have so much fun. This is for me so much fun. Mm-hmm. Many years ago when I first got saved, a friend, a friend of mine said, the Bible is like a tapestry. You know what I'm Woven things, you know. He says, you look at that, you look at that picture and you see this color thread, and you see it emerge, you see it go back on there. It disappears for a while, it comes back up, forms part of the picture, goes back away, goes behind the scenes, picks up again, comes out in another part of the picture. And you follow the color and you follow the threads. And when you're done, you have this beautiful picture. And this is how the scriptures are. The scriptures this pops up here, this pops up there. That's why the scripture says, line upon line, precept upon precept. This is why we study. This is why we look, look, look. This is why we read, read, read. And this is why we connect things. One of my favorite tools for using for using the scriptures is, first off, you got to, to really use the tools, you have to have the words. 
why I tell them I'm a 3D rival. I tell people, uh, I'm not a madman about the King James Version. There are people that are just poo poo in their stand about the King James Bible. They'll just say, oh no, this is the only Bible you didn't get saved with the King James Bible, you never got saved. It may not be the only, but it is the best. <laughs> I trust it. Right. Because there's a peculiar combination of words in the King James Bible where the words, and this is what we communicate with, right? Is what? Words. It's words. So there's a certain thing about the words that are used in the King James Bible and where those words pop up and connect to each other. When you change those words, you do what? You sever the connection. When you sever the connection, you lose your ability to, to, to see part of the what? The picture. Yes, you also start out at the bottom of this list with mistrust and, and, and uh, shame and doubt. <sighs> <laughs> the tools of the devil. <laughs> You're a problem with that, aren't you? <laughs> See, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to put some tools in your hand, something you can use and have a little fun with and look at things. Because I like when I took I took one like that big thing I like like beep <laughs> lit up real bright. Hundred watt bulb lit up that bad. Yeah, this is good. Gotta bring this to my friends. <laughs> and listen. Just another one of the reasons why we have church, so we can bring stuff to our to our friends, our edification. Say what? Edification. Edification. Listen, what's the point of being here? That's right. Listen, I'm here. We're here to be edified, and not just our own friend. I mean, spiritual edification is what Paul said. First thing you got to do in church: make sure everybody gets spiritually edified. But you know what? The fellowship also edifies us emotionally. The the. The bouncing of ideas and perspective ed educates us intellectually and socially because we meet people with different perspectives and it changes the way we see things. Mm -hmm. This panel does not look the same from up here as it does from underneath. Right. It's a different perspective. Seeing the whole picture. And the music sounds the same, but it looks different, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Remember that. You, you, I must, God must have given me that because I ain't smart enough to figure that out. Okay. So, in, all right, back, to, back to the law. So, the law exists in three parts. There's a, the, the moral law, the dealings, with, the dealings between God and man, right and wrong, and man and man, right and wrong, harm, no harm, no harm, no foul. Okay? These things are, these, that's part of the moral. There's other parts of the law. What are the other parts of the law? Come on, don't tell me you have to your old husband. What? It's a physical law. Physical law deals with nature or anything that man does, that God puts there. Okay, okay. That would be, I'm going to break that up. There's a physical law, but that's broken into two parts. Anybody else? Anybody else? Law two. Okay. Dietary law. Dietary, okay. You eat this. You don't eat this. As a matter of fact, you don't even touch this, okay? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm talking, you know, like, you know, like, don't offer an orthodox you a ham sandwich. Oh, no. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's not interested, all right? Don't bring barbecue, <laughs> okay? But God gave the Jews very specific laws about what they could and could not eat. And he gave them very specific laws about how they were to kill the animals. God's law demanded humane. <laughs> that, he, did, he did not. He did not allow people to torture. No, that was something. That was something that was considered under the law. So there's laws. There's 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 a dietary law. There is a. a I want to say the treatment of your animals and your servants also falls underneath the moral law mm -hmm. because that's interactions. All right. And there's a third one, and it has to do with. <laughs> the First, the tabernacle was the Jews are moving from Egypt towards the promised land. Those 40 years in the wilderness, they don't have a temple, they have a tabernacle, they have a tent. Okay? That tabernacle, I'm, I'm going to have to do a study on that too because there's talk about the tabernacle being a picture of the universe, and I'm going to have to write myself a note so I Maybe someone will write that down for me on a piece of paper and hand it to me, so I'll remember to look at that. Because that's something I'd like to do too. 
Uh, but now, in the land, having, having received the place of worship, having gotten into the theocratic kingdom, goes from David to, to Solomon, okay? Uh, now we have the temple to worship in, and there's a whole ceremonial law related to how that worship is carried out. There are animal sacrifices to be made. There are offerings for sin and for guilt and for all other kinds of things that have to be made. There's a separate group of people interacting with God of the Levitical or Aaronic priesthood. And everything is regulated, totally regulated. By the way, and part of that, part of that ceremonial law includes you getting a haircut every two weeks. And the shape of your hair when you get it cut. I mean, okay, are we talking about details here? Yeah, yeah, we are. So you've got, you got the law broken into three sections. Moral, dietary, ceremonial. We're going to look at each one of those things as how it relates to the New Testament. We will not get that yet. Yeah, in Psalm 120 and, and on, um, there was something called Songs of Degrees, and I believe it was like you could get the song and then you can move 10 feet toward the altar and then you have the song and so Wow, that's, see, see, how, see how precise that is, and that's good because that's the musician, see, he understands this. He's looking at, he's looking at, at how this relates to the worship and the law, the ceremonial law. Good catch, huh? good catch. Um, this is a very regulated environment, okay, under the law. We're going to see how things change in the New Testament. Now you can see how far have I gotten on my six pages. <laughs> what are you a third of the way through the first page yet? Yeah. We're not even through the first. Listen. So this is I, I know but you being on the road. If if the faster people allow me what we'll do is when you're not around I come in and I'll, I try to I'll try to do some stuff. God God has given me God has given me a certain amount of liberty. Now, where God says, You can go here, and you can go there. <gasps> I mean, I'm not anchored anywhere. <laughs> Listen, I'm not, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not minimizing the local church. You have a church that's a church, the church is giving you the truth, you're being fed, you have opportunity to, to contribute. Yes, ma'am. As a matter of fact, I talked to the pastor about that today because I really don't know why I can be here specifically. That I like to look at Sunday school a little bit differently instead of going with something that goes over time and might have to be a brilliant you know, lesson thing. You yeah, know? you might end up doing what you want to do is developing some standalone <coughs> uh, life lessons where you get a few more guys. I don't know. Yeah. Every day is a line of road. <laughs> Somebody's saying that. Okay. So I want to so, so, so I hope I have whetted your appetite to think about these different divisions within the Word of God. We know there are divisions inside the Word of God because it tells us that in is that Second Timothy two fifteen. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Yeah. Learning the divisions within the Word of God, learning how those things, how those specific things apply to you. Yeah, that's a, that is very important how that how that goes. Um, I want you to see, we'll do this, we'll, fit, we'll, fit, we'll finish page one. Under the moral law, the Ten Commandments, right and wrong, conflict between God and man, conflict between man and man. Romans 3 spells out why the law is in it. We've got Romans 3, 21 through 24. Brother Mike, please read. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law, and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is, this is where Paul begins to spell out the end of the law. It is it is, it is righteous that the law itself, while the law is righteous, 
and cannot be made righteous through the law. The law has a fatal weakness. It cannot bring life. It can only bring what? This is why you, as a believer, are freed from the bondage of the law. Because it cannot bring light. Well, the only thing the law did was if I if you didn't know something, and I came to you and said, Dan, this is what you did, and I wrote it down. The punishment for these things is what the law does. It tells you that you broke it. It doesn't say that you can be uh, redeemed. It just says that you broke it. It says you're and wrong. the punishment for it has to be administered. That's right. And that's, that's what God would say. So God made a way for that. Jesus took those penalties. And so I don't have, so the law cannot punish me because he stands in the way. Further on from this, we are going to talk about being redeemed from the curse of the law. See, the law was there, and later on we're going to talk about the law being a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But without <coughs> Jesus, without his sacrifice, without his, without his work of redemption. How many people are familiar with the term kinsman redeemer? Good term to look up in your Bible. They beat you up. Anybody, does anybody in here who does not own a concordance? Does not own a concordance? I got one. Go to the book of Ruth. What you should have, what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you now, you should have tools for the job. Strong concordance is exhausting. Like it's this thing. You can use it. If, if you hit someone with it, it will be a with a deadly weapon. It lists every verse in the Bible. If you don't have a, if you don't have a Strong's, you should have a Young's or a Cruden's because that covers a lot of the same things and allows you to do that. Or if you, how many people here have that come future? Your phone. Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway. Some people like blue. Oh, blue, blue letter Bible. Blue letter Bible. Some people listen. There's a lot of search engines on the internet. That allow you to seek the occurrence of words. I like Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway, I enter, you enter in word or combination of words, and bang, it brings you every verse those words are found in. And you go, look at that. And you have, and you have more fun with your mind. This is why I thought you have. If you don't have a concordance, you have a computer. If you have a computer, go to Blue Letter Bible or Bible Gateway, or whatever, you'll find, you're going to find one that works for you. I don't read much of my Bible. You notice I'm not reading my Bible. Everything is what? It's printed on the page, okay? Some people write sermon outlines. Sorry, we break the whole, we break the whole thing out. Because now I do not, not a horrible thing to say you with me. All right? So this is, I mean, all I'm saying is, Add more tools in your toolbox. Make your study more productive. Make it, make it, make it better. Remember, our goal is always to be. What did, what did, what did, what did Paul, Paul wrote to one, to one of the churches and said, I'm, "I'm afraid for you." He said, basically, he says, "I'm afraid for you." He says, "Until Christ be formed in you." Part of our business, being in church, coming to Sunday school, reading our Bibles, is. Is Jesus being formed in us? Being, as we are conformed to the image of what the Bible says, conformed to the image of his dear son. That's right. Well, that's what we're for. Any tools I can put in your hand to help you find that? That's 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 just what do you call that? That's bonus. That's bonus money. Let's pray. And then we can get then we can get ready for the next hour. Lord, we thank you again for the time that we have together. Uh, we thank you for giving us this wonderful book with all these great wonderful, marvelous mysteries and things to see and to do. And Lord, we ask that you bless our, our time and our comes and keep us safe. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.